Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining another Barometer Readings webcast. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital, and on today's webcast, we will provide a brief macro overview, assess the market conditions, and of course, David Burroughs will be pleased to address the call at the end of uh, the, the conversation. So don't be shy, email questions to phastings at barometercapital.ca or hit me up on the Q&A or the chat via Zoom. And with that, as always, I'm pleased to introduce our Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer Capital, David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. How are you hey, today? Pam, it's good to have you back. Great, thanks, glad to be back. I will yep. uh, look forward to your update and of course, let you take it from here. Great. Well, thanks folks, thanks for tuning in. <clears throat> lots, lots to talk about today. <clears throat> I always find that uh, when markets give things back uh, and have a pullback or a retracement, there's lots to learn. Uh, and certainly we've spent lots of time on that over the past week. Uh, and so without further ado, I'm going to kick off, uh, start uh, from uh, the macro view, which is what we always do, to try and understand the environment that we're operating in, see if there are any new clues uh, as to uh, what may lie ahead of us in the market. Markets do a good job of seeing around corners and often before we read things in a newspaper, market has picked up on change. Uh, and I think it's really important <clears throat> to look for those clues to try and make sure that the portfolios stay aligned with, with what's actually happening, not what you think should be happening or what you think was happening. Because one thing that is constant is change in the market. Um, from a broad perspective, we continue to believe that we are in a structural bull market in stocks. And I know that there are a tremendous number of incredibly bearish investors. If you read Twitter on a regular basis over the last couple of days, I'm not sure I have ever read more bearish commentary uh, or more certainty about the fact that this market must be just like 2000 or just like 2008 or just like 1974. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit about that along the way. Um, but one thing that I have found over time is when investors are absolutely certain of something and everybody is seeing it the same way, it is rarely how things turn out. So we have to keep an open mind and we have to look for uh, uh, confirmation of our views or something that may contradict our views uh, to consider whether or not we should be making changes to the portfolio. But here's the S&P going back to the early 1980s, the bull market from 1981 through 2000, which was marked by sort of four steps forward and one step back. The one steps back were not, you know, uh, uh, unimportant. They in some cases lasted 18 months or in some cases were over in two months. Uh, but the, the commonality between them is they were resets. And what came out of each one of those corrections was a significant, long, consistent run higher in prices. And each time you had a rollover, people were convinced that it was done. So we do know that in 2000, you got a very different type of bear market. Market rallied had another very significant bear market. We all lived through 2007, 8, 9. These are structural bear markets. They are life-changing bear markets. They are bear markets. We have to do everything we can possibly do to avoid. And they mark people psychologically, such that every time then you get corrections going forward, people look for <clears throat> the monster under the bed, which is you know the comparison to that last great bear market. So as it sits right now, if this structural bull market that started in 2013 was over, well, it's been very short, 114 months versus 216 months in the 80s and 90s. That's more like what has been typical. Total return of something like 173%, which is not overly uh, a big number. It would be a very short, low trajectory bull market if that were the case. Uh, but I suppose everything is possible. When we look at rates, we have a belief that we saw the ultimate low in a generational bear market in rates or bull market in bonds that ended in 2020 at generational lows in rates. We know that we had a tremendous rally off the lows and broke the long-term downtrend that have been in place in 10-year yield since 1982. Uh, and we corrected. Uh, and here we are sitting right now around 3%. This chart is just a couple of days out of date. 
Uh, and so once we traded through this declining moving average, markets have a tendency to digest that original move uh, and uh, yields have been chopping sideways over the last couple of weeks. When we look at commodities, we have a view that from an asset class perspective, and again, we're taking a top-down view first to say what asset classes have a tailwind, looks like we saw a, uh, a secular bear market bottom in commodities in early 2020 during the COVID sell-off. <clears throat> and relatively, stocks have been underperforming commodities since then. And when that has happened in the past, it tends to be the commodity outperformance goes on for a long time. Now, keep in mind, after you know 10 years or 12 years of a bear market, these are not going to be well loved. And there's going to be lots of people that will tell you why it is that this is just some kind of a fake reversal or one that doesn't matter or all the reasons why you know stocks are going to make a comeback versus commodities. Uh, but my general view continues to be we saw a structural bottom in commodity markets that if we look at the producers of commodities, they're very, very inexpensive relative to other sectors of the market. And there are structural deficits because of years of underinvestment in new capacity. So when we look at the RJI index, which we've been doing each week, this is the long-term picture from 2008. This is an unweighted or equally weighted basket of commodities across all different types of commodities, bottomed in 2020, broke the downtrend or the bear market uh, in the beginning of 2021, marched higher month by month. We had one little corrective period in 2021. We had two months of correction in May and June, finishing near the highs for the June month. And here we are above that level. Uh, commodities have bounced nicely off the market lows. If we take a shorter term view, this is a one year chart. You can see that the RJI index came down to the 200 day moving average, held it three times. And you can see that while there was weak relative strength through June and July versus stocks made a turn. And actually in the course of the last 10 days, while markets have been pulling back, commodities have powered ahead. So I think it's really important to look at what happens when a market pulls back what holds the strength? What gives it back? When you have some kind of a perceived market low, often you will have a combination of real buying and short covering. And when weakness reemerges, very often what was short covering gets sold off again quickly. And what has been real buying may often continue and not go back toward lows. And you can see that that's exactly what's happened with this RJI index. In a period of seven or eight days, while the S&P pulled back a little over 5%, RJI index, in fact, has moved higher, gaining once again from a relative strength perspective and above long-term trend. So let's look at some of the subgroups. Energy, oil in particular, has been one that has been very resilient over the course of the year. The BNO, which is the ETF for US, for Brent crude, uh, is up 46% from beginning of the year. This is one of the things that has been inflationary in the system. And certainly oil pulled back from sort of the mid-120s down to the mid-80s, but firmed up again and today traded through $93. On my point and figure charts, that breaks oil out to the upside. And we've talked about in previous webcasts that the near-term future has been weaker than the futures contracts further out, like say December of 2022, which did not pull back to the same degree as the near-term future did. So I might speculate that some of the selling in energy have been financial sellers concerned about recession, concerned about potential demand destruction, but we know supply remains very, very tight. This is a, a chart of US commercial crude oil stocks weekly in millions of barrels. And we know that there has been a tremendous amount of oil pushed back into the system out of the US strategic reserve. In fact, it's come down significantly and some question as to how long they can continue to sell from the strategic reserve. But you can see that inventories really have been decimated. So you're in a very tight market. We've seen very little by way of new production coming online. We talked last week about the fact that gasoline inventories are well below five-year averages, that diesel inventories well below five-year averages, and even jet fuel, despite the fact that we went through a period of weak travel, trading right at the bottom end 
of five-year averages. So whether it's refined products or crude, we have a shortage and supply is not coming on fast enough. Now there's three things that we wanna keep an eye on. One, when price gets to a particularly low level, it kills supply. In other words, nobody reinvests to put on new production. There's a zone which OPEC is targeting, which is between about $90 and $120, which they believe is a sweet spot because it will not be high enough to, to, to destroy demand, but at the same time will be very profitable for the oil companies. And then there's prices where they get too high and it actually kills demand. And that ultimately is not good for, for anyone. So the net of it is we are in the low end of this range between 90 and 120. And it's the sweet spot for oil and gas producers. When we look at natural gas, natural gas is more bullish. This is North American natural gas trading at new highs today, but of course, much weaker than natural gas in Europe, which is being constrained by Russia's supply through their pipeline. When we look at the longer term picture of natural gas, again, it looks a lot like that RJI index coming down in lower highs and lower lows from 2008 through the bottom in 2020. And slowly natural gas has moved in steps higher, most recently correcting from just about $10 to five and a half, that was in uh, June, but very quickly back through into new highs. Again, that is a structural change in the market and we don't want to ignore that. It's the middle of summer. This is when uh, natural gas pricing should be relatively weak, when they should be restocking inventories in storage. And it does not look like that's what's happening. So clearly energy is continuing to be a very important area for the market. Agriculture, agriculture also in the commodity space after correcting sharply, but quickly, over the course of the month of June, held on for a long time against a bear market in stocks that started in December. Once again, over the course of the past two weeks, trading back toward recent rally highs against the stock market that's been weakening. So this is the DBA ETF, and this measures a composite of different types of agricultural commodities, including soybean, corn, wheat, uh, and so on. So look, Important to understand the big picture. And the big picture for us is what we, the work that we do on macro, which is trying to find parts of our investable universe that are seeing expanding breadth, where more and more securities within those groups are performing well. And what I can say is in general, equities are acting better and breadth has been solid. We've seen better performance from commodities those two are sort of reflationary assets and we've seen fixed income continue to be sloppy and almost uninvestable especially in the longer maturities and so these are the groups that we've been focused in from an asset class perspective now we're going to talk sectors in a few moments but of course we've tried to find these structural themes and then we look for securities that meet our business tests fundamental improvement or, or acceleration in the underlying financial metrics and technical metrics or technical behavior in the price patterns that would support that positive view. And we use those single securities within the groups that we like to build our portfolios. And that's a living, breathing thing. So the portfolio is actively managed. We are ready to make change at any point in time. And the most important piece is outside of what our fundamental and technical view is, we have a very disciplined selling strategy, which is, uses uh, the mechanical use of st stop losses. So to the extent that a position doesn't work out as we hope or expect and comes down and breaches our stop loss, it's there to make sure that a little mistake doesn't turn into a big one because something is happening that is outside of what our opinion has been. We need to see that our view and the market's view are lining up such that we have the fundamental and the technical both in our hands. So we use this to help address getting to the right asset class within the right asset class, get to the right sectors and themes, and with using specific securities, try to express our view to build portfolios. Okay, so top down is all about seeing areas with expanding breadth, more and more securities participating in a rally. That's healthy. There's no bear market ever took place while you were experiencing expanding breadth. 
It's not about what the index is doing because indexes are made up of lots of different securities, some of them weighted more than others. It's what the average security is doing and whether the average security more and more of them are performing well or in a, a deteriorating market, if one by one securities under the surface are starting to sell off, that's deteriorating, but that's bearish. Okay, so our job is to do three things. One, identify market leadership themes, to target those areas, to recognize change, new leadership as it emerges and old leadership as it recedes. And then third, and most importantly, be prepared to play defense if and when we start to see deteriorating breadth or price behavior in the individual securities that doesn't line up with our bullish view. We have to be prepared to stop our way out. So it's a very tactical approach. Now on the June the 29th, after many, many weeks of very sloppy market behavior, our long-term breadth models were solidly negative. In other words, we had seen a, a March list of securities one by one breaking down. We saw over time, fewer and fewer stocks trading above their 50 day or 10 week moving average. We saw fewer and fewer companies with positive weekly price momentum or upward trajectory. We saw fewer and fewer companies making new highs while more and more companies making new lows. And we saw very few companies trading above their 150 week or 100, uh, uh, sorry, 30 week or 150 day moving average, which means very few stocks are trading above long-term trend. As of last week, it was a very different picture. Six weeks goes by, five weeks goes by, breadth models uh, for the major markets positive, percent of stocks globally in uptrends had been expanding, and our short-term indicators all expanding. Now, we did highlight the fact last week that some of these were getting to a higher level and that the market was perhaps a little ahead of itself, trading a little more than 8% above the 50-day moving average, which often meant stocks could pull back. We had traded right down underneath the 200-day moving average, which was declining, which meant probably that was going to be a bit of a headwind. And this downtrend that had been in place since the beginning of January or the bear market converged all in the same area. Now, we put this up at the end of last week's presentation. When the market gets to be 8, 9, 10% above the 50-day moving average, very often market pulls back a bit. And in fact, we put this data up on the screen. That over the next week, you could see as much as 6% pullback. Well, lo and behold, we saw 5.5% pullback in the S&P between the time we did that webcast and yesterday at the market's lows. So maybe it is that we've seen sort of the outsized pullback. That remains to be seen. But we also highlighted that there were several positives in the market that we had to consider. That while the S&P was rallying, the advanced decline line was actually rallying more quickly than the market, meaning that the average company was doing better. And it was a broad list of securities trading higher in the course of the rally. We also highlighted that any time you had gone from an extreme low in the percent of stocks trading above their 20-day moving average or their 50-day moving average, and then quickly trading up to 80% or 90% above their 50-day or 20-day moving averages, those tended to be very important turning points for markets. So here we go, 2009, a dip below the 10% level, up above, the 85% level for percent of stocks with the 50 day important market low. Okay. Similarly, we saw that in 2011. Similarly, we saw that in 2016. Similarly, we saw that in 2020. And similarly, we saw that, uh, sorry, 2018, 2020. All of those triggered, and the same thing had just recently triggered, meaning that there was a very good possibility that the lows are in. And again, that remains to be seen, but history would support that. We also highlighted that when 90% of S&P 500 companies get above their 50 day, which we did uh, uh, on the 14th of August, and that tended to be very important and that the forward looking data tended to be pretty good. You did see that it was a five day period in 1988 where you pulled back 5.8%. Again, very similar to what we've done over the last week, but going out one month, two months, three months, six months and one year, 
very positive data. So what's happened? Well, we pulled back about 5% off the highs. And that's scary because lots of people have highlighted, well, maybe if we rally to the 200, this would be the end of a bear market rally. I don't think that the data supports that at this point. I think that probably we got a little ahead of ourselves. We're headed into a seasonally weaker period. We're bound to have some chop. But again, there's lots of things that I think are important. Most important is the breadth models remain positive. And yeah, we get a little pullback in some of the short-term data. But when we look under the surface, there's some important clues. The value index or the value portion of the S&P 500 that had relatively outperformed all through the year, that was leadership during this bull market and pulled back sharply in June, July, reestablished relative strength off the lows. And in the pullback over the last few days, a little over 2% pullback relative to what happened in the S&P. When we look at small cap stocks, the Russell 2000, we highlighted they've been in a bear market since February of 2020, so almost 18 months. But that since May, relative strength has turned positive and again, remains positive. In fact, close to a relative strength new high going back to the early part of the year. So value performing well off the bottom, but at the same time holding up well through this most recent decline. That's leadership getting tested. But this is a change from the relative performance over the last 18 months. And this really was the period of bear market for tech and small cap stocks. And arguably 18 months is a long time for this to go on. And perhaps all the negative news is discounted into the market. So let's look at uh, the mid cap value ETF, same picture, relative strength growing all the way through the year, through the decline and through the rally and through this most recent pullback down 2.9% of the lows over the last five days. So I think these are important clues. These are broad indices. It's not just the top 10 S&P 500 stocks. They would say that a lot of bad news was built into the market over time, that very negative sentiment and defensive positioning may be limiting the amount that is for sale at this point. And then when we look at the QQQ, which really was the epicenter of the sell-off over the course of this year, a little relative strength off the lows, but the first time we get a pullback, market pulled back, yet the QQQ pulled back more than the S&P. In other words, the buyers disappeared. Now, not to say there aren't some strong stocks in here, but I would say what this is saying is the leadership in value, the leadership in mid caps, the leadership in the broad market has held during this pullback while the weak QQQ and tech sector, which did rally in June and July, gave back gains very quickly. That tells me it's unlikely right now that QQQ or tech becomes leadership again in the near term and that the leadership leading up to the sell-off in spring in value and mid-cap is likely to persist. Now, there has been lots of negative economic data over the last couple of weeks for people to worry about. We talked last week about weak home construction. We talked about the weak U.S. empire manufacturing data. This week, we had weak manufacturing PMIs come out of Europe, and we had weak uh, PMI data coming out of the US. So the concern of course is recession and the concern of course is that the economy gets weaker. On the other hand, the initial jobless claims, claims are not really ramping up at this point and the employment market remains pretty robust. From a positioning standpoint, this week, the futures positioning by speculators combined S&Ps and minis is even more defensive than it was last week. So this is the most defensive that investors have been since 2009. That means that if people were concerned about risk, they've had lots of time to get positioned. And there are very few investors who are out over their skis. And it would be a surprise to no one to read, we read weak economic data or concern about raising rising rates or conflict in Europe 
or concern about China, these things are pretty well in the market. We know the cash levels continue to be very high. One thing people may not be considering is that because of tax changes, S&P 500 companies are actually accelerating their share buybacks, another source of demand for equities. So there may be less selling going forward, a little bit more buying. If investors are behind the curve on the year-to-date returns, they may need to put some money to work to try and claw back their year. But things that I think are important are that credit quality apparently is not getting worse. The excess return investors are demanding to buy a corporate bond versus a government bond actually has been moving lower over the last few weeks, despite the fact the stock market was correcting. And most importantly, if we look at the Citigroup Index of Economic Surprise, which measures whether economic data coming in as a composite is beating estimates or weaker than, I think two months ago, we saw an important low. When we look back in time, when you get these reversals, it tends to go on for a while. So we know people have been concerned about economic data, but when we look back over time, these reversals tend to be important and it may well be the market has discounted a lot of negative news into this market and positioning has been set up to take advantage. There is the volatility index as of last week, as of this week, sorry, again, still firmly within a lower range. So now let's talk about leadership. If we are more bullish on equities than we've been in the last couple of months, what is it that's holding up and what is it that's not? Well, the most important segment for the Canadian market and for our portfolios over the last year is energy. And certainly the Canadian capped energy index did pull back to the 200 day in the beginning of June, but since then has been marking its way higher, especially against a weak tape in the last two weeks where we're making new highs going back to, um, going back to uh, the beginning of June when we got the second leg of the sell-off. Relative strength has resumed to the upside and the market has rallied 5% over the last seven days while the S&P was selling off. That's a really important clue. That's resilience in the face of weakness. We talked last week about some of our energy positions. Vermilion, we talked about today was trading at a new high. We talked last week about tourmaline, which is more gas focused. This week I'll put up Advantage Oil and Gas. Again, new high for the year and new relative high versus the market. In the US, we've got a couple of major positions, ExxonMobil, Hess Corp and Conical Phillips. Here's Hess again, up sharply over the course of a week week uh, for the stock market. Uh, no shortage of leadership in this group. Energy Service also putting in a strong performance over the last two weeks, trading now well above the 200 day moving average and better than 85% of companies in the S&P over the last year. So outside of traditional carbon based energy, lots of strength and some alternative energy. I put up the lithium LIT ETF uh, because it clearly came uh, out of a bear market more quickly actually than carbon-based energy. Of course, this is a major component going into batteries. But again, off the lows bottom before the market did, when the market made its lows in June, had already put in a higher low. And here we are today trading back above moving averages. I think this is an important theme and lots of companies in this area that look quite interesting. So as we've been highlighting, relative uh, oil and gas relative to tech has been making a turn now over the course of the last two years. This little pullback we saw in the spring, we said three weeks ago, probably was a wiggle on the way higher, and it does look to be the case. Let's look beyond energy. Financial is an important sector for the market. Last week, we put this ETF up on the screen, the KBE, which is the US bank ETF highlighting the fact that relative strength for the KBE has been improving since March. So in other words, bottoming from a relative perspective before the stock market did. Uh, and this week on the pullback held in quite well. <clears throat> the Canadian banks did the same. Canadian banks are down 6.9% on the year. Uh, relative strength turned higher as the market got started to weaken over the last couple of weeks. 
Uh, and so we think that Canadian banks are attractive. We talked a little bit about those last week, but some of the insurance companies may be more interesting. This is Intact Financial, a very defensive company, approximately 50% of their businesses, um, uh, property and casualty insurance. Uh, auto insurance is doing better in Canada than it is in the US. And this company's trading virtually at 52 week highs and Progressive uh, Corporation, which is also PNC in the US doing particularly well is also. So against this week tape, there does appear to be some areas of strength that investors can focus in. Moving beyond those first two sectors, we talked last week about having a barbell approach, about having a series of defensive positions from consumer staples and utilities and high dividend payers to pair with those reflationary sectors. This is the XLP or consumer staples ETF down a little over the last couple of days, but up down only 2.1% on the year. Relative strength has been trending higher. And again, good relative strength through the course of a sell-off. We talked about a couple of names last week, Loblaws and Dollarama. Here's Hershey, uh, which we own in Saputo. Saputo has been going through a straightening out of their supply chain <clears throat> uh, and doing a very, very good job. Uh, dairy products coming back quite nicely, trading at new relative highs for the year. In the utility space, capital power, a 4.6% yield, combination of more traditional power generation and also wind power, trading better than 93% of companies in the S&P, trading just a whisper off the 52-week highs for a nice defensive sector with uh, dividend and dividend growth. They've grown their dividends over the last three years by 3% a year. So put those together and dividend payors and dividend growth stocks, again, outperforming the market through the course of the rally and this little pullback. Looks quite nice. This, is, this uh, uh, ETF is yielding uh, about 3%, uh, and the dividend growth rate's been about 8%. Looks a whole lot better than fixed income to me. So defensive sectors, energy, industrials we talked about last week, make new relative strength highs for the year as of today. And inside their transport's looking particularly good. We talked about CP last week. Talk about ATS automation today with an order book that continues to have a larger and larger backlog. Lots of companies spending money to automate, to help uh, um, uh, become more productive in their businesses. In a supply chain uh, uh, restricted world, automation is an important tool in trying to bring productivity. Uh, and this company is trading for stronger than 80% of companies in the S&P over the last year. TFI International is a transport company in, in Canada and the U.S. They bought UPS shipping. They've done a very good job of taking that into the business and again, trading better than 90% of companies in the S&P. So there is some very clear leadership in the market. Now let's talk about materials because over the course of 2020 and 2021 until spring, this was an important sector for us. We did reduce our exposure in the month of June. Partly because from a fundamental perspective, these are highly economically sensitive companies. These are metal producers, steel producers, chemicals producers. <clears throat> but also the broad market looks at these as economically significant and they were liquidated in the sell-off. But look, relative strength has returned quite smartly during the months of June and July. And even during the sell-off, and the week period over the past week, making new recent relative strength highs. So we think this is important. The metal and mining sector is very inexpensive relative to other sectors. Relative strength has been improving since June and up sharply since the beginning of the year. The XME is up 12.5% year to date in a year where the markets had a very difficult time. Yes, it's economically sensitive. And yes, financial sellers may have been liquidating but these are products that are in short supply and it's not easy to ramp up supply. When we look at the longer term picture of the XME, which we highlighted over the last year, the XME made an important low in 2015, a higher low in 2020, came out of that bear market trading range in 2021 and broke out. And in the course of this equity bear market pulled out tested support and has turned back higher it may well be that this is one of the most counterintuitive sectors 
for people to be invested in if they're concerned about the economy. But if we're in a reflationary environment and there is a structural shortage of supply, it could be that pricing remains firmer than people expect. This is one of the companies in the group that I think looks very attractive. It's tech resources. Of course, it's made up of energy. It's made up of uh, metals. Uh, it's almost like a mutual fund <clears throat> of commodities. But again, pulled back into the breakout point and has turned sharply higher over the last few weeks. This could be a sign that this remains leadership in the market. So a few weeks ago, we put this chart up that metals uh, and mining uh, valuations hit a low in 2008 and hit another significant low in 2020. <clears throat> and we could see a combination of earnings growth and multiple expansion as we come into a new economic cycle that could mean be very meaningful to, for the, these companies. Also in, in this group, I talked about the lithium group, LIT. Nutrient is a company that we recommended on BNN. Very sharp relative performance <clears throat> since the market low in June. And in fact, making a new rally high today. Now let's talk about technology. Technology has been the darling over the last many number of years. <clears throat> Unprofitable tech started selling off in February of 2020, starting the bear market. The large cap tech rolled over at the end of December 2020, sorry, 2021, and relatively underperformed until the market low in June. We highlighted last week, there has been some improvement. But again, let's get back to the question. What is it that rolls over and pulls back the first sign of weakness in the market? And what holds up? Well, tech has rolled over and it become weaker. So this is by no means conclusive, but this group sold off 5% in five days. There was no relative outperformance. There was some strong areas and some weaker areas. We happen to have some Apple, which has been relatively outperforming since June. But certainly there is weakness in that in this part of the market and one that we have to watch. Other areas that relatively are underperforming communications continue to make new relative lows, nothing to do here. REITs making new relative lows, nothing to do here. This is a classic asset that gets helped by falling rates and hurt by rising rates. If we're in a rising rate environment, it makes it kind of tough. Uh, and consumer discretionary, which is an important sector for the US market, has had weaker relative performance versus the market since February of last year and really made no gains during the bounce and pulled back sharply over the last six days. <clears throat> so what does this all mean? When we looked at breadth readings across sectors at the beginning of June, all of the sectors on this chart in small letters had been showing deteriorating breadth. In other words, be careful. When we look at where things are today, <clears throat> it's a different picture. In almost every sector, the percent of stocks and uptrends has moved higher. All of the sectors showing capital letters are showing expanding breadth, and there's a lot of them. There's a few sectors that have turned back down this week, semiconductors and internet. Well, that fits in with tech. Home builders, consumer discretionary, retail and auto, consumer discretionary, gaming, consumer discretionary. So some of tech has given back its gains. Some of consumer discretionary has given back gains. Some of communications have given back gains. Some of the areas of strength have held them very nicely. What does that mean in our portfolios? Well, our largest weight continues to be energy at 16%, almost four times the weight of the S&P. Combination of oil and gas producers. <clears throat> Industrials are much larger than we were a month ago. We were at 6%. We're now just about 13, about the same as we were last week. Same for financials. Utilities and consumer staples, the defensive bent in the portfolio remain both around where they were a week ago. Last week, technology was 11%. If we pulled that back to 8% on some of the failing strength. Government bonds, a month ago, we were at 27%. We used those as a source of cash to put on new positions within equities. And at the other end of the spectrum, real estate, consumer discretionary, communication services are relatively non-existent. We added almost another 1.5% to materials today 
on a very strong performance in companies like Nutrien, which is now closer to 5%. So there is leadership in this market and there's lots of things to worry about. Outside of North America, Japan continues to be an outlier. Despite all of the concerns about a weak yen, the Japanese stock market is trading very close to highs for the year. On the other end of the spectrum, the countries that are being hurt most by rising energy and inflation, <clears throat> especially Europe, are relative underperformers. In our macro portfolio, we are short the Eurozone equities, making new relative lows today. This is where we were a week ago. And on very high energy prices, a week later, sharply lower. When we look at <clears throat> Germany, very, very sharp pickup in producer price index year over year, 36% gain in inflation. German market selling off sharply. So it's a market of haves and have nots. The US still is seen as a relative safe haven for equities and very well insulated from inflation because of the very strong US dollar. Strong US dollar of course makes it very difficult on emerging markets and emerging markets continue to underperform. So just to recap, basic materials and commodities performing well relative to equities, equities acting much better than they were in the beginning of June, probably still with some more chop in front of us from a seasonal perspective. There are some very specific sectors within the equity markets, most of them under owned sectors and unloved like energy performing better and fixed income really not on our radar stream for new positions. We continue to believe we are in a structural bull market for stocks and the correction that we've seen up to this point is very similar to other corrections during bull markets. I know that there's a lot of scary news and that's why some parts of the market have been correcting now for over 18 months. It's why there is a record net short position in the S&P 500 futures. It's why sentiment is as low as it's been since 2008. But don't forget what can come after these corrections. When we look at market corrections due to an event, and the most recent one being the coronavirus in March of 2020, which disrupted supply chains and the problems that we've seen globally, the following five years can be very, very important. We don't wanna miss these. From a shorter term perspective, this has been one of the best summer rallies ever. When we take the returns for July and August and plot them back over time, recently there have been three years that have had the kind of returns that we had. And when we look at those three times, the final four months of the year added 13%, 17%, and 20%. So don't get too bearish. Let us do the worrying. We're gonna to continue to watch for signs of weakness. And if we have to, we'll get defensive. But in the meantime, let's take this step by step and remain open-minded to all the potential outcomes. Pamela, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. You know, Dave, here in South Florida, school's back in session, but I know that people are still enjoying the last few weeks of summer holidays. And I'm waiting with anticipation for a question out there, but I have not received one yet. So, um, you know, I think, uh, I think you did an excellent and thorough job and we can call it a day. Okay. Um, well, so thanks everybody for, for tuning in. If, if you got questions that you're too shy to ask, please reach out to us. <clears throat> uh, I'm happy to jump on the phone. Uh, if you've got questions about your, your portfolios that are residing with us, uh, the counselors are standing by. They're, they're ready to answer any questions you've got. If you uh, are not with us uh, but would like to know more, certainly don't hesitate to reach out. We are in the business of, of growing our business, and, uh, and we like to meet new people. So, uh, Pamela, thanks so much for being on today, and, and everybody, Great. thanks for tuning in, and hopefully this is useful. If you've got questions that you'd like us to answer in, in future webcasts, please... Uh, please send them in to us and we'll address them. Um, thank you, David. Thanks, Pam. And uh, I get the opportunity to do BNN tomorrow morning at 930. 
So we'll have a quick start to the day if anybody wants to watch. And um, let's, let's see how things go over the next few weeks. Thanks so much, everyone.